In this lecture, we're going to move on from our discussions of building animals, where we've mainly focused on arthropods using Drosophila as the premier uh, model. And there's been work done on other arthropods, so they're expanding the base for our understanding of arthropod development. But we're going to look at vertebrates. For consistency's sake, we're still going to concentrate on the patterning of the anterior to posterior uh, axis of the animal. But I want to point out that there's a dorsal to ventral patterning. You see that in paper number six, which is part of the reading assignment. And we're not going to do it in detail. So I'm only having you read a little bit of a portion of that paper number six. But understand that we're going to do some detail on anterior to posterior, that the other th two axes all exist in vertebrates, just like in uh, the arthropods. But we're not going to study those in detail. There are a number of model organisms that are used for development in vertebrates. The mouse is a really good model for um, higher vertebrate development, but it's also very, very difficult to work with. And this is because mammals maintain their embryos internally. Now, you can still do it with mice, but it requires sacrifice of the mother and the embryos at the correct stage, so you have to sacrifice many, many of them. You can't just watch it occur along the line, although techniques and methods are getting better and a little bit less invasive. But studying development of mammal embryos is very, very difficult because they are held inside the mother. Whereas with Danio, which is commonly called the zebrafish, and Xenopus, which is the African clawed frog, they lay their eggs, and the, so development occurs externally. Not only that, but they have a lot more offspring than mice do, as, as fecund, that means how many babies you can have. As prolific breeders as mice are compared to other mammals, they're nothing compared to fish and frogs and other egg layers, which can have tens of thousands of offspring sometime throughout their life, life cycle. One of the other advantages, especially in Xenopus, they lay very large eggs relative to their body size. And the eggs are primarily um, see-through. So the fish to some extent also. But So you can actually watch development occur, particularly with modern techniques, without killing the embryo at different stages to see where it's at. You can kind of watch things progress. And so the Robertus et al. paper, paper number six, which you're reading for this unit, um, focuses on Xenopus and a lot of the work that's come out of patterning in Xenopus. So it's not really a true model organism, but pretty close. It's got lots and lots of work done on it. You might get different answers from people depending on how they define model organism. So just be aware of that, that they all would be good models. And of course, the mouse would be the best for looking at human development because it's most closely related to us. It's a mammal like we are. But for um, logistical reasons and ethical reasons, um, cost is part of that logistical decision. We often uh, do developmental studies on frogs and fish. Okay, so we are going to review. This is, um, I guess, not review from this class, but you most likely have seen it at some level in another class. If not, it's just something you'll need to learn. In higher organisms, including all of the bilateria, there are three germ layers that are established very, very early on in development. And we haven't really focused on these yet, um, so I have not gone over them and reviewed them, but at this point we will need to because our understanding and model of vertebrate development uh, relies on patterning of these three uh, different layers of tissue, and they serve as both receptors of organizing signals, and they themselves, different parts of them, can serve as organizers for later development. Okay, so we have three germ layers that are established very early on, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Hopefully that's familiar to you. The names are fairly explanatory. Ectoderm means tissue on the surface, mesoderm means tissue in the middle, and endoderm means tissue on the inside. However, I think this can be a little bit misleading. So the early ectoderm, it becomes the um, skin, Right? And then other uh, epidermal layers also derive, so a little bit down into your throat, a little bit uh, your large intestine is derived as invaginations of that early ectoderm layer. So pretty much your skin on the outside and parts of your digestive and, and upper respiratory, upper digestive, upper respiratory tract, and then your very lower digestive tract, those all are ectodermal in origin. The other main thing that comes from the ectoderm, which is very, very surprising, is the nervous system. And for me, this is surprising because I often think of this as the most internal, right? But yet it's ectodermal in or or origin. So how do we explain that? How do we get this the brain, right, which is right inside your skull and your nerve cord, which is inside your, your spinal column? How do those things get into those very internal areas 
if they originate on the outside? Well, that's a little teaser. We'll talk about it here in a little bit about how that occurs in broad terms. Okay? But just know ectoderm is epidermis and nervous system. Mesoderm is uh, muscles and skeletons and a couple of organs, including reproductive structures, ovaries or testes, uh, kidneys, and heart. So, but primarily, if you just remember mesoderm as bones and muscles, that's and maybe other connective tissue, that's a really good um, general guideline for mesoderm. And endoderm is most of your major internal organs, organs. So most of your lungs, again, not the very most upper parts of that respiratory tract, but basically from the place where your esophagus breaks off from your trachea, that is all, below that is all endodermal in origin, your lungs, your liver, your stomach, your, uh, most of your digestive tract. Um, and accessory organs, that's all endodermal in origin. And these three layers are set up very early on in the developing embryo, okay? Now that applies to some extent to all um, bilaterians. Sometimes they're also referred to as triploblasts, right? It means three layers of, of these early developing tissues. Okay, so here is the early vertebrate embryo. Um, and so when it comes to vertebrates, all early embryos have some remarkable similarities, okay? So we're going to look at actually four of them, um, and three of them are really the most important for, um, actually I'll point out five, but these three are the most important for what we need to talk about as far as the development of the organism. So they've got a notochord, which is a support structure for the nerve cord. Notice that the notochord is below or in a ventral position relative to the nerve cord. And the nerve cord, of course, will become the brain at the anterior end, and then it will become the spinal column, and then efferent and afferent nerves will connect and, and develop from that nerve cord. But notice there are two structures here. We've got the nerve cord itself, and then the notochord, which is a support structure for the nerve cord. Okay. Now, um, in addition, there is this structure that we call um, the neural tube, right? And the neural tube is basically the, the um, nerve cord, but at an early stage where it has this very tube-like structure. It looks a little bit like a garden hose, if you will. The third structure that I want you to recognize are these subdivided mesoderms. And each little division is called a somite. So we typically don't think of vertebrates as segmented, and they certainly aren't externally. If you look at them, there's very little hint of any segmentation. But internally, in both muscles and, cert muscles and certainly in the skeletal system, there are remnants of our ancestral segmentation. And the somites are the little bundles of mesoderm that originate as repeated structures, right? These modules recurring over and over and over again and later develop into these repeated bones and, and also connecting muscle groups like the abdominal muscles and some other repeated muscles, okay? Now, in addition to these three, which we're going to talk about developmentally, there are two others that you should know that are characteristics of vertebrates in during these early embryo stage. They're both listed here. The pharyngeal pouches, which become gills and gill support structures in many organisms, but become part of the pharynx uh, in uh, higher organisms like um, reptiles and... and mammals. Uh, and then, of course, the postanal tail, which has muscles and bones attached to it. In humans, it's greatly reduced just to the three little bones and our coccyx. But in other organisms, it, it's very important, enlarged. It can be used for balance. It can be used for um, uh, hanging on to things, for, for um, uh, what's the term I'm thinking of? Um, it'll come to me here in a little bit. Uh, Anyway, as a grasping, as a grasping structure, like in some monkeys, some lizards have a tail that can wrap around branches and help them grasp things. So it's an important feature in many organisms, although not so much in uh, humans and, of course, the other great apes also. It's, it's very, very reduced. Okay, so just know that those are all general characteristics that develop more or less in, in all vertebrates. Okay, so let's now look at these first three as um, important components of early development. And I'm going to actually, I need to adjust this. I'll fix this on your PowerPoint. I don't know why those didn't get numbered. Okay. So as development occurs, signals are received that divide each of these somites into subsections. So this is like a cross-section through um, the organism where we've got a right side and a left side, and the head would be facing out towards you at the screen, and the tail would be going way into the back of your screen. Okay, but this is like a cross-section. 
And notice that this early developing bundle of tissue is now divided into very distinct structures. There are lots of names for these. I don't care that you memorize them. I don't want you to spend time memorizing them or, or looking at them. I won't ask you in, in great detail about these on the exam. But I do want you to know that these are all mesodermal in origin. That's the names, right? And they begin to subdivide into different components. Some of them are going to become connective tissue. Some of them are going to become bone and uh, muscle around each of these developing somites. And these work through a reciprocal signaling system. So each of these serves as an organizer and send out signals that allow uh, the other proximal, the things that are next to it, and distal, so the proximal one and the distal one going out farther out, receive signals back and forth to establish the boundaries between these different levels. And eventually we get formation of bone around the neural tube. We get formation of um, the connective muscle and then uh, other other tissues that support and connect to each of these individual somites. Now, the one thing that, and I don't have a diagram for this, but the one thing that I do want to point out is that notice by this stage, the neural tube is beginning to be more internal. The neural tube actually originates as a long furrow of epidermal tissue along the dorsal side. And so you can think of it kind of like um, a ditch, right, that's dug all the way from the head to the tail of the early developing embryo. But instead of being dug and throwing away it, basically what happens is we get cell division and invagination migration along this really long furrow. Eventually, as that furrow continues to get larger and larger and submerge, the top migrates and closes over, and thus we get the dorsal hollow nerve cord, which is, again, a little bit like a garden hose or a tube running from the head to the tail. And at this point, all of these individual somites begin to divide and gather around this dorsal hollow nerve cord or the neural tube. Um, and so that then, as, as the, uh, these mesoderm elements continue to develop, they surround the tube eventually on the brain. They surround it and develop into the skull along the um, thorax and down through the abdomen. They develop into individual vertebra and also vertebra that pass the abdomen into the tail. So each of these develops into its own little repeated segment and eventually nearly completely encloses the nerve neural tube. Of course, nerves begin to expand out and grow out from those bones as they develop around it. So it's a very detailed and, as you can imagine, complex process for each of these. But we have some very um, hopefully familiar ideas to you that we have organizers signaling back and forth as to kind of where these different parts of tissue are going to develop. We also have repeated segments, right, modules, where one is the same as the other initially. And ancestrally, all vertebrates kind of had the same thing after we got past the head. The head developed very early on. And then all the rest of the segments were very, very similar. But later, as fish develop, as uh, terrestrial animals develop, we get quite a, a, a distinct differentiation of each of these somites along the anterior to posterior axis. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at how those somites are patterned. Now, this is quite different, and this is a, a, a contrast from the arthropods. So remember, in the fruit fly, we have a number of gap genes and then the pair rule genes that set up each of the individual segments. And those typically come on from an anterior to posterior pattern. We didn't really talk about that. In fruit flies, they come on really rapidly, pretty much almost all at the same time, but that's a little bit of an exception to the rule. So engrailed in most arthropods comes on very early. It's engrailed as one of those um, pair rule genes. Um, sorry, it's a segment polarity gene, but it's part of these patterning of the segments. Um, that's not important. You don't need to memorize what stage engrailed is at in that five stages of the developing arthropod. But essentially, we get all of these segments patterned by uh, uh, different groups of genes all turning on these same target genes to say, grow a segment here. Later then, the Hox genes help to specialize. So we're going to compare and contrast that with vertebrate development from anterior to posterior. And while we don't have external segments, we do have these internal segments, the somites, that we can look at in a very similar manner. They're thought to be homologous, and, and both the external arthropod segments and the internal somites of vertebrates are thought to go back to the ancient ancestral segments of a common ancestor. So the way the somites up, uh, are patterned are a very interesting thing with a different gene. It's still uh, um, a um, homeodomain gene, 
but one that is doesn't play this role in um, in arthropods. Okay, so here's how it works. And we're going to go back and forth. You can see it occurring here. This shows some of the data that was used to generate this diagram and pattern that we're going to talk about. And so what they noticed is that genes uh, expressed in the head were very, very important for patterning. But this was kind of where there was a little bit of a, of a, of a weird thing, is that these genes would come on in the head and be expressed there, and then they would migrate. That the cells next to the ones at the head would express the same gene, and then that gene would be turned on to the next group of cells, next group of cells, and next group of cells. And so if we caught embryos at different stages, they could actually watch this migration of this gene until it reaches the most posterior end of where that gene is. And then it kind of settles down, and those genes continue to express that key signaling gene. Okay, And so then this would progress another wave of expression, another wave of expression. And in some ways, this is a little bit like stacking um, rings. I don't know if you ever played with this game. Let me find it here. I think it's a very common toy that many kids have. Um, you might have played with it when you were a kid. I did. Maybe it dates me a little bit. But um, this is what I always think of when I think when we look at this uh, model for how um, these somites are, are um, patterned. So you got a ring, you can put it down, you put the first one, second one, second one, you can stack them however you want, but typically you stack them like a pyramid like this, right? One after the other. So if that helps you remember, great. But this is basically how vertebrates are patterned in the anterior to posterior uh, axis. We have a wave of expression. It's a notch pathway. There are a number, number of genes, but I think notch pathway is easy. That's what we need. And these move down this mesoderm that we were just talking about. They're basically passed from one to the other, so it's like sliding down that, that uh, column in the middle of the ring stack. And eventually, this reaches all the way to the end, and we get our, the first somite pattern. And then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. And there's kind of a clock-like pattern to this. It takes about 90 minutes. I think this was in the frog for one of these somites. So after a day or two, you have all of these individual somites that are patterned by this wave of expression being passed from one cell down to the next. And so we've set up segmentation, right? Internal is a little different than arthropod segmentation. We've done it in some ways very similar. Uh, the end result, at least, is very similar. But it's a very, very different mechanism and a different pathway of genes that sets it up. So this differentiation of, of segmentation, although it was common in a present ancestor, the mechanism that controls it seemed to have diverged quite significantly between arthropods and vertebrates. However, here's some similarity. After these segments are set up, we have these same genes, the Hox genes, that are patterning what each of those somites will become. And in some organisms, like the very earliest organisms, the earliest chordates, um, like Amphioxus, I don't know if you know that, you might know it from Bio 1 or Bio 2. Amphioxus is sometimes also called the lance, lancet, um, which is a very early remnant of some early lineages of chordates. Let's take a look at it just so you know if you're not familiar with it. Lancet, sometimes again also called uh, Amphioxus. There's a journal. Uh, let's see. Amphioxus will get us there. There we go. So here's, an, oh, Lancelet. That's why it didn't come up. Sorry, I misspelled it. But Amphioxus, it's, um, they're still quite common, but not they're not a ton of species, so they're not as diverse as this group once was. But basically, they have a very rudimentary brain, for, uh, rudimentary mouth parts, many, many repeated muscle groups and segmites. They don't, they, they're chordates, but not true vertebrates, so they don't have a backbone, but they do have a notochord, um, just like uh, vertebrates do. It just doesn't develop into the vertebral column. And the key here is that each segment past the head is very, very similar to the one before and the one after. So very little differentiation of each of these individual segments. We don't have limbs going off like flippers or fins. Uh, we don't have legs. So a very simplistic early organism that has still survived and still has a small niche to fill. But most species of, of chordates, including all of the vertebrates, have much more significant diversification of each of those individual segments. And that diversification, just like in arthropods, is controlled by expression of the Hox genes. We have more Hox genes in the vertebrates. We'll look at this and, and uh, talk about where they came from, although you hopefully already have some idea. But that's a subject for a later discussion. So know that both um, arthropods and vertebrates 
have segmental identity, or if you want to call it somite identity in the vertebrates. But that, after the, each individual segment or somite is established, their identity are patterned by combinations of Hox genes with overlapping expression, so very, very similar. Now, in the vertebrates, because there's so many Hox genes, there's a little bit more redundancy and also more complex patterning that can occur because of all of the different overlaps. So, for instance, the development of some of the complex parts of the hindbrain are controlled by many different overlapping um, expression domains of different Hox genes. So we have, but there's still these anterior Hox genes all expressed in different patterns with some redundancy. So if you get a mutation in one, sometimes you get no phenotypic change. It's not until you get mutations in two or three of them that you start to see strong phenotypic change. And so we have a little bit of redundancy, but in addition, we also have more potential overlap patterns that lead to more complexity. And so the complexity of the vertebrate brain is a really basically a outcome of this duplication of Hox genes that allows for more um, differential patterning of these different regions. But the control for them is very, very similar. We've got um, cis regulatory elements upstream that respond to different genes, turn them on in different regions. And so starting out with all these similar somites, differentiation occurs by Hox genes being turned on in different patterns. They then turn on downstream target genes and we get final um, stages of development for these different body parts. Okay, so the hindbrain is a great example of this complexity in the anterior to posterior that arises from having extra Hox genes in the vertebrae.